We then move on. Once a if a single sample works, we can do more robust types of experimentation if we start to look at multiple, multiple samples. So we might have a, a single population that we want to draw more samples from, or very often there'll be a second population that we want to draw some samples from. Um, and these could be the same customers. It's the, it's the customers who walk in the store as a population one, the customers walking out of the store as population two. It could be the students coming into a class as the population taking a pretest in population one. And then when they're done, they take a post test to see how much they learn. So it could be the same customer or widget or process coming through a larger scale process, uh, but not necessarily as we go through. So typically we take a first sample in the education example, that might be the pretest uh, coming through. And then a second sample. Okay. Um, to show how things come in through. And we draw those kinds of um, samples coming through. And we, we continue doing pretty typical hypothesis testing. We're looking at averages and things of that nature. So typically we're looking at um, the average of the first sample and the average of the second sample. Sometimes it's really is X and Y, um, X1, X2 works just as well. And what we're often very interested in is the difference between those things is an average difference. So a customer walking in the, do in the door has a certain amount of money to spend. How much did they actually spend while they were there? A student entering a class has a certain score on a pretest. Uh, they take a post-test when they're done. We measure how much they've improved. So we're often very di interested in the difference between values coming through. And if, X and, if the two X's um, in those samples fit the, fit the requirements for being described as reasonably normal uh, or normal type of curve distributed, then D, D bar will also do the same thing. To a certain extent, D bar is a new random variable that will obey many of the rules of a single sample test. The main rule it will not agree on um, is in the degree of freedom or the V variable that you'll see in some of the um, calculations among all of this because as I look at the difference between two samples x, x bar 1 minus x bar 2 equals the d bar um, but I can't subtract the variances the the different the difference fits on the, the mean but the variances have to be added so as I bring these variables together um, the situation gets more complex because typically I'm looking at higher order degrees of freedom as I go through so you'll see among many other things in such a chapter, you'll see that we typically take the standard error squared uh, squared again um, over standard error to the fourth divided by the n minus one as we go through. So there's, there's a way to calculate the variance. Now that's actually the formula if there's only one sample coming through. And if you do a little algebra on this, you'll find that V with a single sample is equal to N minus one. So if you didn't know where the N minus one came from in doing the variance calculation for the single sample, this is basically it. It's this formula, which algebraically reduces to simply N minus one. For a two sample set, typically this standard error one here, and I use M for its number, I add to that the standard error two squared and I take this entire set squared over um, SE to the fourth over N minus one. So there's a different term here, if you'll see, you're, I'm adding the variance as I go through. So as the number of samples grows, the calculation for the variance and the degree of freedom becomes much more complicated as I go through. So don't be intimidated by equations like that. They're not as complicated as they look. It's simply a way to add up the variance and accumulate it across the variables that we're working with. The extra complexity that comes in the two sample test that we didn't have in the one sample is that there could be huge differences in the two populations going through. What if I'm looking at the average calculus grade for a group of students um, and in one, one population I chose from high school seniors and another I chose from engineering majors, seniors in college. Well, of course, there's going to be a huge difference um, in those populations. So I got to be careful how I do the statistics across the two populations. In an ideal setting, I want to pair the data in the two populations. So um, you'll see the, the term pair or pairing often discussed um, in the literature. It would be great if the pretest and post-test um, are taken from the same person enrolling in the class and then finishing in the class, or the customers walking in the door and the same customer walking out the door. If I can pair people in that way, I reduce my degree of freedom because now I'm, only, I'm taking two measurements but from, with only one degree of freedom. 
um, I can tell a lot about what's going on in the data. I can actually pair them. So I may still have the problem that I've got a pretest for someone who drops the class, so I don't have their post test. I might have a post test for someone that enrolled late. I still have to deal with those kinds of issues. But for the most part, I can reduce a lot of noise by taking, allowing my samples to pair in the sample the data for instances that were paired in the population as I see my way through. Sometimes I can't do that. Sometimes it really is only one population of people because there's no people that are in both populations. So I can't pair them back in the original populations, but I still want to pair them coming through um, so I can look at differences in populations across time and differences in samples. So at that point, you'll see the term blocking used in any, any text or discussion of um, two sample experimentation, two or more sample, I should say, but basically here on the, the two sample hypothesis test, we're going to do our blocking as we go through, where we try to anticipate what kind of variables might exist in our population that would partially explain the differences in the data and therefore become noise. So if I want to do a pre and post test of people coming through a class, um, or I might, I might want to measure um, how one population of people in my online class compares to all the people that take my live class, where there is no student who's in both populations. But I want to be able to draw conclusions that allow me to know whether two students learn better in the online class or the live class. Well, for that, I've got to block out. I've got to eliminate certain variables. So if I say among people who take online or live classes, it could be that the academic level makes a difference in how they do in class. So seniors who enroll in a class might do differently than freshmen who enroll in a class. Uh, likewise, whether you're a full-time full -time student or you're working um, could make a difference. Uh, whether you are um, a major or a non-major, um, your um, income level, you know, so your socioeconomic status, your, um, your age, or your, at least your age bracket. Uh, these are things that could affect how well people do on the different testing that I'm doing. And if, if in fact, I choose samples of people from my online class and my live class, where in one group I happen to pick a lot of older working people who are majors, in another I happen to pick a lot of younger non-working people who aren't majors, uh, I'm going to try to conclude that one class does better than the other, but in fact, it's the blocking variables that I should have accounted for that explain most of the difference. So when I create my pairs in the two samples, even though they're not the same people in the population, I'm going to tend to pair two data points for people that are the same academic level, they work or don't work, they're majors or non-majors, the same economic bracket, the same age bracket. So I, if I pair people according to that, then I've taken those variables out of the running. And if in fact, the difference in scoring tends to be support my hypothesis, it will be because of the difference in the class, not because of the differences in these variables. So it's a way to remove certain variables from the discussion. In doing so, I give up a lot of degree of freedom. So my answers will be less precise at the lower degrees of freedom. Um, so I've got to make a choice. Do I want a less precise answer that I can be sure I'm measuring what I think? Or do I need a more precise answer even though it might not accurately be measuring what I think I'm measuring? And somewhere in that continuum is the sweet spot I'll do in any particular experiment.